The opinions expressed in the following program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of Rogers nor Rogers TV. Hi, and welcome to Politically Speaking. I'm David Shearman. My guest today is Dr. Ian Ara, who is the Medical Officer of Health for Gray Bruce. Dr. Ara is kind of like, dare I say it, the man of the hour? David, <laughs> thank you for having me. Uh, I, mean, I mean, I don't mean to make, but in all seriousness, you and your position, Dr. Ara, are, are the sort of center for what we are experiencing with COVID-19. Um, I, I don't think that you are in service. Uh, serious. I, I am thinking. You know. Thank you for having me. It's yeah. it's a very timely time to timely period to be online talking to the public using the media because it is uh, it is concerning situation. Mm -hmm. And like you rightly said, uh, public health is the center of service, and we are glad to be of service. What I found really interesting is I in this country is that as maybe compared to some others. Uh, we have our politicians making announcements about politics and economics as they should. But on the other hand, we have people who are fast becoming uh, familiar names to all of us, Dr. Tam, Dr. Williams, uh, who are medical officers of health, Dr. Tam for Canada, Dr. Dr. Williams for Ontario, yourself for Gray Bruce. And all of a sudden, it's very clear, this is, <laughs> we, we have public health officials who are making, who are telling us really solid information. It's very different from what we have seen before. Normally this would be politicians. Here it's both. This is a very safe statement. The, the public health specialty has leaders and they're trained for, for many years. Uh, to be a physician, you need to go a lot of training than to be a specialist mm -hmm. in public health. Again, it's five years of, of training similar to, to surgery. And uh, to, to be able to take the responsibility, the authority, and the liability to be in this position to serve the public yeah. in these uh, times. Uh, public health, I, I heard it from a mentor a long time ago, earns its credits in health uh, protection, spends it on health promotion. Ah. More specifically, when we need to protect the community from outbreaks, especially pandemics, we earn a lot of credit. Down the road, we can spend it on telling people, please quit smoking, please don't right. drink. I, I, the credit is, uh, is, is not a you know, positive or negative concept. Uh -huh. it, it is uh, the, the proxy to serving the community. And I know public health during these days is the essential or the center uh, service for serving the community. Well, I think public health in, in this country and in particular in Gray Bruce has, has had a very high profile. Um, obviously you're front and center with COVID-19, but we think of Walkerton. We think of uh, SARS, we think of H1N1, and um, I Ebola. think we were, sorry? Ebola. Ebola. Preparation. We were thinking, yes, we were thinking, I'm thinking also of the uh, opioid crisis. That's right. Where, and and the, the, that, that is, was beginning to bubble up. Now our attention is fully on COVID-19. And it's, it's a, I think it, it's a credit to us as a country and a province that we've, we've got these resources available to us and uh, people are are listening and that's a that's a good thing that's a good thing I have to say too that that I, I appreciate the messaging that has come out from both the federal provincial and local levels because it there's one there are two things that are are um, strike me number one it's honest nobody's sugarcoating anything um, nobody's making uneducated guesses. And number two, um, it's info it, it informs without alarming. You, you mean you, you and your colleagues are saying important things to us and you're giving us things we can do. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, good, it's a good message. It's a, I want to compliment you on that. So far it's been, nobody's running around losing their head, um, unlike some other countries where there are confusing messages. So you guys are doing, your, you people are doing a great job. Thank you, and, and I explained, this is uh, 
I can elaborate on what you said. There is scientific ground behind it. Yeah. Uh, there is a gentleman with the name of Peter Sandman. He put a framework for communication, and it's a useful uh, framework where you would look at, at any situation. If people uh, are uh, driven by fear, mm -hmm. it's going to be crisis management, outrage management. It's not the proper type of management. Rather, you put people or try to direct people uh, to have the right information, be transparent, don't sugarcoat it, don't, over, uh, don't exaggerate the fear. Uh, let them be in that uh, spot where they're concerned, but mm -hmm. not afraid. And to my delight, our um, community in Grey Bruce is right at that spot. Uh, the uh, local municipalities, local politicians, provincial politicians, uh, and federal politicians, and politicians like you said, rightly so, all of them are uh, supportive of the scientific uh, opinion and whether it's delivered by the uh, top doc in, in Canada, top doc in province or the MOH in, in Grey Bruce or delivered by the politicians, it's coming from the same source, yep. scientifically based. Right, and th th I think people have to remember that. This is, this is solid information, it's not fake news, it's not off the wall, it's solid scientific information. Can you explain very briefly what a coronavirus is? Certainly. So coronaviruses, uh, there are a family of viruses that usually uh, mainly are in animals. Sometimes, rarely, they, jumps from, they jump from animals to humans and rarely, even more rare, they will jump from human to human. And as long as there is that human to human transmission, we will get an outbreak or pandemic like we have. SARS was an example of it. MERS, uh, COVID-15, uh, sorry, uh, MERS uh, was another uh, disease similar to, to um, uh, SARS, and COVID-19 is the third example that uh, in the recent history we know of. Uh, because they're novel to humans, there is no immunity. In, one, in any one of us to them. And that's where the novel coronavirus name comes from because it's, it's, it's new. Correct, new. Yeah. It's not novel from book or any other right. type of uh, <laughs> No, it's not it's a book, just it's, new. Just, it's new. Okay. Right. So uh, these, these uh, viruses, when they transmit from human to human, they, there is no immunity to them. And currently there is no medication, there is no vaccine. So the odds are they're going to spread. Depending on uh, certain uh, characteristics of the bug. It could be community spread, like the flu, or it could be uh, localized, uh, able to be contained, or there is an ability to contain it, like SARS. The COVID-19, um, to, to uh, the best of the data we have, is heading to community spread, no question. And this question, actually, I had no question for the past six weeks that it's going to go to community spread. It was communicated to people in the field, or to the politicians, and everybody has been preparing for it. There is, again, the, the, the preparation stage for it, and it has been, uh, to, to my delight, very successful. Comparing to our experience in SARS, it was, you know, we have now robust protocols refined uh, through SARS, after SARS, in the preparation for Ebola. So we're deploying these, um, measures in, in, in a, a proper, smooth way. We learned, in other words, the system learned and has learned from SARS, from Ebola, from whatever to that it will, that so that every time we hope we're getting better. Certainly. And, and if I may elaborate, to simplify it for uh, people who are concerned or interested, there are two types of interventions in public health when we're dealing with these outbreaks. One is containment. Second is flattening the curve. Flattening the curve is a technical term for the epidemiology curve that uh, takes the shape of a bell. And it, it's based on the number of cases increasing day after day to peak, then goes down. And uh, in both categories, we have robust protocols in public health. Uh, I can attest uh, firsthand uh, we have top-notch protocols. Well, I think of containment would be something like um, influenza at a nursing home. You Correct. contain it to a particular case, isn't that right? In a particular area. Correct. That's exactly it. Probably SARS is a very clear example to people. It was in hospital. Mm -hmm. didn't go into the community far. 
Uh, any case we hear about, for example, the two cases from Grey Bruce that we heard about a couple of days ago, uh, I'm not, I have zero concern that we're going to be able to trace back where they came from and who was exposed to them and contain it. Containment is is done deal um, for, for any case that we find. The second uh, category, the flattening the curve, interventions are more or less social distancing. Mm -hmm. And to my delight, again, that's what we heard uh, the province implementing. That's what we were uh, planning to impl implement um, for, for our area when the time is right. Uh, it, it's worth mentioning that um, community spread diseases hit bigger centers earlier than the rural. For example, the flu hits Toronto two, three weeks before Sudbury or Thunder Bay. So um, right now, the provincial measures to self-distancing is very timely for bigger centers and it's very most needed there. For us to follow it is, is uh, basically icing on the cake. Um, the it, level pr it protects. It protects. It's the level of risk in Grey Bruce is lower than other areas. However, to be consistent with the sector, to uh, uh, be proactive and protect ahead of time, it, it uh, was my recommendation yesterday to issue strong recommendation for businesses to close. And to my delight, what I'm hearing is um, the uh, general response from businesses is fav favorable following instructions. Well, I have to say to, say to you that, that I was, just before the show, I was out in the community in, in my truck, and I drove past uh, a McDonald's and a Tim Hortons. Parking lots were empty. Usually when I was driving by, there'd be people in having coffee. Yet the, I, the chairs were on the, on the table at Tim Hortons. And in both cases, there was a bit of a lineup at the drive through so pe people are, and businesses seem to be honoring that. Um, makes it kind of difficult to find a cup of coffee downtown, but you know, <laughs> other than Tim Hortons. But well, well it's a trade-off, you know, not yeah. having the cup of coffee and not getting Corona is a good deal. <laughs> That's very true. That's a good very deal. Very true. So the, I hear you saying very clearly the risk in Grey Bruce is lower, but not zero obviously because we now have community transmission um, in uh, anywhere in the country I guess that's a in, in some spots in, of the country uh, there has been evidence of tra community BC? transmission. BC especially? Correct yeah big centers uh, we had a plan to implement um, type of surveillance called sentinel surveillance where we can find if there we have it uh, locally or not, and in communication with the hospitals, different uh, stakeholders, we, we can implement it. However, uh, the fact that we went to social distancing, it becomes a futile exercise because we were planning to implement the sentinel surveillance to make the decision for social distancing. This is done to my delight again. I, I totally support mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and uh, echo the provincial recommendation to social distancing. It's funny. Um, the, the you speak of you were going to do this, but we got to here. That's the way this 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 um, pandemic seems to be working. Um, we've gone from here on Sunday to here on Monday to here on Wednesday, and goodness knows where we'll be on Friday or or next week. It just seems to be rapidly escalating, um, and the number of cases seem to be escalating as well. Is this what we can expect? It is what we expected, I would say, seven weeks ago when we got the initial data from, mm -hmm. from China. Uh, the, the number I had, my own number, was similar to the number from the province, similar to the number from Dr. Tam, from the Federation, similar to the academia number. Uh, doubling uh, time is two to three days for uh, places where there is transmission, established, uh, established transmission. If you implement social distancing, it becomes five to six days increases. So and, and that's what you call leveling the curve. Correct. By Flattening increasing the, 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 the time of the doubling. Correct. You, it's a, I mean, it's kind of hard to get your head around, but, but if you can increase the time that the case, in, in the increase in the number of cases, you allow the system to be maintained at a particular level and handle those cases. Uh, precisely. The main goal from the two categories I was talking about, yeah. the second category, flattening the curve, the goal is to spread the cases on longer period of time mm -hmm. 
instead of getting, let's say, this X number yeah. of cases in two weeks, let's spread them over three months so the healthcare system can better handle uh -huh. them instead of stalling the system in, in one time. And, and it really go, like I can go through details of epidemiology, but oh, that's not, sure. we're not gonna bore <laughs> the No, we're not gonna listeners. go that way. The, the essence of it is the reproductive rate, the rate yeah. of yeah. Uh, each person, each case is gonna infect how many number of cases. Right. So for this disease, it's two to three. Each yeah. person, if you leave it up to, the, to nature, each person is going to infect two to three people. And if you implement social distancing, hand washing is essential, cough hygiene, if you're sick, self-isolate yourself. Um, all these things will reduce the number of new cases. And instead of the total number of cases for a community to be doubling every three days, mm -hmm. it will be after four mm -hmm. or five or six. And hopefully we're going to get to a number where each person would infect one person mm -hmm. or less. And that's where we be successful to stop the disease. One, you, you mentioned the other form of response, which was containment, and I presume that would be things like closing borders and cutting off transportation links immediately and kind of erecting a, a wall, or as someone said, yeah, a toilet paper wall. <laughs> but, um, but that wall, um, that containment wall is the kind of thing that uh, well, every, a lot of people have been saying it should have been done a lot earlier. Would that have worked? Would that have been any any better than, than the strategy we're following? So l let me adjust what he said a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, closing borders, restricting travel, uh, travel advisory, um, airport screening, all interventions related to social distancing, they would affect containment, but not specifically. Containment is a set of procedures in public health and protocols, uh, case management, contact management. So if we are know about a case, we will go and see where they got it from, who we we're exposed to, and mm -hmm. we follow that chain with contact management. So contact every one of them, tell them mm -hmm. what to do, test them, and we ensure that chain has cut. How do we know about cases? That's the beauty of public health. There is a set of surveillance mechanism that people don't know about. It just happens in the background. Passive surveillance, active surveillance, sentinel surveillance, and enhanced surveillance. For example, the passive, any disease of interest to the public, labeled as reportable disease, anybody who issued the test or when the test goes to the lab, the lab will send the medical officer of health or the health unit a, a copy of that. And we have that already with some diseases. We have it We have it running all the time, whether yeah. it's TB or salmonella, outbreaks or, or Whatever. these things. Yeah. So yeah. when we have these diseases, we can follow them with the other procedures. So that's containment. We do it really nicely. I worked in World Health Organization in Copenhagen. I can compare our system to others. We fare very well, top notch. Social distancing, the flattening the curve interventions, are more or less communication to stakeholders, the, to the public, uh, the connectivity coordination between the healthcare system and, and the public health and other players around mm -hmm. the table. And the public, again, it is in the hands of the public to hand wash, to distance. If we uh, do our job well, and I have no reason to think we're not, um, we will we will go through this. The sky is not falling. Mm -hmm. I am very concerned as a medical officer of health, but the sky is not falling, and uh, I'm sure we're going to go through it uh, mm -hmm. nicely. So, but s the, the the movement or the cries to seal the borders really would not have made much difference then, at any point in particular. Uh, the the there is a lot of evidence that these interventions might not might not work. Yeah. Uh, is there a specific case for Canada that say it would have worked or not? I, you know, the science, we never ex experiment with it. During 9-11, for example, some institutions ran a study. How did the flu behave in France where no airplanes were grounded versus the United States was grounded for, you know, whatever it was, days or weeks? So the difference was the risk significance for landing airplanes. But this is different from Canada. This is different from other places. Um, screening at the border uh, or advisories mm -hmm. are interventions. Closing the border is one intervention among many, many others. So whether we implemented it or not would it have made much difference. Uh, I, I really cannot attest with data. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
Mm. Yeah, it, 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 this goes kind of goes along with the sort of next step. The, you often hear the same, well, we need to send in the military, but the military have no role in this, do they? In, in, in a public health emergency like this, they, there's no, by, by, by calling out the army, it's not gonna make a whole lot of difference to anything. It might even put people at risk. So at, at this point, I wouldn't see uh, there is need for a military. Yeah. Uh, you know, the definition of emergency is when the uh, resources, local resources are exhausted or imminently to be uh, strained. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So now we, we are being proactive. We implemented these measures. Mm -hmm. If everything goes well, that's great. Let's say there is a winter storm in two weeks. Do we need the military to help? We might. We might. So yeah. I don't want to exclude the idea, no. but it wouldn't be you know, military going to hospitals to do the work right. the physicians would. My point is that there are some who have said we need to militarize the country in order to respond to this. And that's, that's not a public health response. That's somebody else's response. That, that's right. Uh, and again, uh, this bug, the COVID-19, yeah. There is no immunity to it Yes. right now before a person gets infected, mm -hmm. infected and mm -hmm. heals. There is no current vaccination and there is no treatment. And uh, t to the best of my knowledge, the military doesn't have the vaccine too. <laughs> right. We're all at risk. Right. We're all at risk. Um, let's, let's shift a little bit to talking about what will be coming um, in the next few weeks. Uh, well, actually, probably before the end of this week, people have been traveling. They are, they've been asked by the Prime Minister to, in probably the most direct language I have ever heard, saying, come home now. And people are, are, are doing that as to the best of their ability. Um, what's going to happen when these people land in? We, we saw what happened with the cruise ship passengers and those who were in Hubei province, um, they were isolated for 14 days in a quarantine facility on a Canadian military base. There's a role for the military. But we've got thousands of sunbirds coming home. And what about them? Are they potentially infective? Are they, are they people who should, should they self-isolate? Well, the recommendation anybody who's coming from international travel to self-isolate for 14 days mm -hmm. for uh, you know, the protection of preventing or reducing the spread to yeah. other people, but at the same time to protect themselves too because this is social distancing we already implemented for all of us. David, if you look at the numbers from the states, there are around 5,000 cases last time I looked at it or around that time, and the population is around 300 million. Our cases in Canada, about 500 or a bit more today, out of 30 million. It's the same odds. So the background risk in the States might not be much different from the background in right. risk in Canada. Right. It's always better practice to, and, and this is a recommendation, to come home and self-isolate. But at the same time, this is a message for people who are you know, wanting to be afraid or anxious. There is no need for angst around people who are coming back. Right. They're citizens like us, and uh, they might have similar risk like us. Uh, it's for all of us to prevent transmission, whether a person traveled or not. Yeah, the interesting thing is that we just want, we as neighbors just might be able to help people who are self-isolating by ensuring they have access to groceries, because you can always leave, leave the groceries on the step. You can talk to them by telephone. Uh, in fact, I, I know of one, one family um, that they, they told me that um, this woman was saying her, her mother and father-in-law were coming home from Florida and uh, they usually stop at the family house, uh, their daughter's house and stay overnight and then go on to their, their, their final destination. And uh, the daughter said, no, this is the way it's going to be. You are going to go straight home. We will turn on the heat. We will turn up. We will turn up the heat. Turn on the power. Make sure the power is working. Make sure you've got lots of groceries, and we will make sure that you will be supplied for the next two weeks. <laughs> that's that's a better practice. That's yes. an informed decision. Uh, as as a son to two older adults living mm -hmm. in London, 
Uh, I miss them dearly, but I told them, you know, stay home. Yeah. We're going to get you food to the step, anything you need, medication, mm -hmm. prescription medication. We will get it. My siblings are there. Uh, it, it is, uh, you know, I'm going to miss them. There is electronic means to communicate. Mm -hmm. There are fo phones to talk to. It's going to be weeks or hopefully not many months. But uh, um, at the end of the day is to reduce the risk and especially the older adults, anybody over 65 with heart disease or lung disease, these are the vulnerable people who mm -hmm. would suffer uh, of this. So the yeah, well, it's one of the things that I noticed is that the mortality rates for those over 60, are they increase significantly, and by the time you reach 70, it's co even more significant. Correct. The numbers uh, you know, give you different estimates, but all of them are, are increased for mm -hmm. people over over 65, 70, even especially if there is lung disease, heart disease, cancer. Mm -hmm. You know, to the general public, every hundredth person infected, 85, oh, we're not gonna know about it other than mild cold, if any. 15% will have severe disease, maybe going to the eMERGE or the hospital. 2%, 3% uh, critical disease, possibly death. Uh, but again, those two, 3% is probably mainly our older adults, yeah. and that's why it's uh, worth mentioning. I know the the program today is politically speaking, but mm -hmm. uh, it's worth sending uh, a message well, to the public that it, poli please. politics and health intersect in this case. So. That's right. So I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> big backing problem. and sending a couple messages. Not a please, unless you have an essential a trip to a nursing home or hospital, there's no need to do it. Um, uh, be mindful of uh, of your neighbor, older people, if you can help in any way, like David, you said, all these mm -hmm. good things. Those are uh, the people who would suffer most mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. And and again, we it's in our hands to hand wash, to follow coughing hygiene, cough in a tissue, uh, cough in a sleeve, or, or uh, self-isolate when one is sick. These good old habits are our really key in this you know like it might become broken records saying them but you would know not know how important they are on unless we implement them mm -hmm. and see the results in mm -hmm. uh, it's account. a it's a funny thing that, that I remember encountering my first hand washing uh, video actually it might even have been a 16 millimeter film 40 years ago and and it was a you know it was basically you know wash your hands uh, don't touch the taps uh, make sure you're uh, scrubbing for at least 20 seconds, l use soap, but it's still true today. It, it is, and, and you know, I'm a realistic person. I, I don't live in fantasy. I know it's difficult to do these things. Yes. But now in this time, the situation is so concerning that uh -huh. we need to make it a habit, and we are creatures of habit. As a father of one living in Grey Bruce, uh, we have a three-year-old kid, my wife and I. Uh, we make it top mind. We are mindful, mm -hmm. that's the word mindful comes, top mind, that we need to wash our hands quite frequently with water and soap, hand sanitizer. Yeah. Uh, and if we make it a habit for the coming weeks, it will go for a couple months, and that's what carry us through this. Right. And I would recommend it to every family, to every person. Yeah. The flip side of that is, is um, and I remember in a personal situation, uh, a family had a, Particular, particular case of um, communicable disease, and they finally figured out the problem was the towels. They didn't wash the towels frequently enough. So that it's not just washing your hands, it's either using a paper towel, which is fine, or if you're using a cloth towel, wash it regularly or, or change them out regularly. And yes. uh, it's a very, you, you gotta think about this stuff, this just a little bit to figure out. Okay, what do I need to change? What do I need to make better? Th that's exactly it. The thinking, mm -hmm. being mindful, mm -hmm. it will help everybody, and especially the older adults who are vulnerable for this. Yeah, yeah. A and what I mean, especially those people, if we do it ourselves, it would help older adults. Sure. Reduce transmission. Sure. Yeah, and it's really worth mentioning something else since I'm, I'm <laughs> on sending messages. Um, the ER, a person should not go to the ER unless they have severe disease. The right. ER is not for a person who's, you know, do I have COVID or not? No. Uh, am I coughing or not? Uh, there are assessment tools, online assessment tool issued by the province. There are assessment centers opening uh, in, in Grey Bruce uh, this week. 
and uh, in three locations related to hospitals. Uh, a person can call the Telehealth Ontario. That's always a good number to call and see. You can call your healthcare provider if you want to get tested. But please call before going there. Mm -hmm. and, and if you are, have severe disease, enough to go to the ER, call before going to the ER. They will be prepared to receive yeah. you. And uh, that's doing the right thing. Well, we're going to take a quick break and we're going to come back and have more conversation about COVID-19. I'm David Sherman. This is Politically Speaking. and We'll be right back. program is brought to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command. Visit rogers.com for more details. We were born in Canada. We spoke English. On the streets, we weren't welcome. But on the field, we were the assassin. Vancouver's champions. Everyone cheer for us. Our people have a voice. Then Canada declared a war on Japan. They took us from our homes, called us enemies, forced us into camps. But we brought the game with us. Baseball helped get us through the internment. The Vancouver Asahi were among the 22,000 Japanese Canadians interned during the Second World War. The team never played another game. Don't forget to tune in to Gray County Life on Rogers TV next week. We're going to be talking about the Owen Sound Bayshore Subaru race. The opinions expressed in the following program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of Rogers nor Rogers TV. Hi, I'm David Shearman. Welcome to Politically Speaking. My guest is Dr. Ian Era, who is the Medical Officer of Health for Gray Bruce. Dr. Era, good to have you back. Always good to be here. Now, we were talking just before the break about um, some of the things that are, are happening around going forward in terms of COVID-19. There are, I understand, three um, specific uh, COVID-19 screening centers, one in Owen Sound, one in Hanover, and one in King Carden um, for, at the hospitals. But you shouldn't just show up, right? You shouldn't show up at the screening center if you think you got COVID-19 symptoms. What should you do first? Uh, a person can show up in these. The ER mm -hmm. is where they need to call okay. if they have severe disease. The screening centers is basically to, to triage people. Do you have symptoms severe enough to go into the hospital or not? And to protect people in the ER and the hospital from getting sure. the disease. Uh, it's worth mentioning, not everybody who's gonna go to the uh, screening center um, or the assessment center is gonna be tested. The test is uh, reserved to certain people who the management of whom will change, mm -hmm. whether it is uh, somebody returning from travel or healthcare worker, or there are different uh, types of categories for these. Uh, however, everybody who's gonna go to the assessment center, if they need to, will get a t template, or a, sorry, a pamphlet of information to what they can do, whether if they have symptoms to self-isolate or other things, uh, or uh, be told, you know, you qualify for testing and this is the instruction. Uh, or test uh, being there as well. So it, it is a function to triage people not to go to the ER uh, automatically. So it's kind of like a, a fr front line for people with a specific set of symptoms. Correct, and it is a better practice in the middle of mm -hmm. an outbreak. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, there, you, you mentioned that there, is a, th there are questions online. Uh, I presume that's... Uh, I think, if, I think, as I recall, if you type in 
Ontario COVID-19, it comes up pretty darn quick. Or the, the, the Grey Bruce Health um, Unit webpage will take you right there too. Correct. The website for the health unit or the Ministry of Health or the will hospital. have all the resources. Yeah. The hospitals, I presume, they have the same thing. Mm -hmm. And it will be a self-assessment. You know, you click on it and you read the criteria, whether you qualify or not. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're aiming for electronic tool where a person would click and say yes or no to certain question. And uh, in, in, like in essence, I know people are anxious, I want to be tested sometimes right, at right. that. But you know, the test is not going to change the management. There's no treatment for right. it. Right. And if you don't have severe disease, the management is go stay home, have uh, plenty of fluid, a chicken soup, believe it or not. It's, <laughs> it's a really good thing because, you know, it shuts the appetite like any disease. Well, uh, folks, soup you heard it here. Acceptable. Here's the doctor saying yes. chicken soup. Chicken soup. Uh, and and uh, usually it's a mild disease for mm -hmm. most people. And uh, it, it's, again, uh, preserving these resources, the samples, yeah. the swabs, to the people who need it most. We yeah. do a lot of work in, in a health unit for containment. Uh, the, the two stages I mentioned. Yes. Uh, one of it is any possible case in a nursing home. We go full blast with testing and we need swabs for this testing. And if it's positive for, for COVID, we're gonna uh, follow certain protocols with uh, cohorting, you know, separating people who are sick from not sick. And, and preserving resources for these efforts uh, is essential. I can, I can, uh, you know, I take ha my hat off to our team and the ID team. They're burning the candle at both hands. You know, whether in responding to uh, questions from the public, we opened a few hotlines, uh, and or, or whether responding to case management, contact management. So I, I have no worry about that part. But I do believe the bigger picture is the public need to be engaged, and they are and mm -hmm. informed and do the right thing so all of us we're going to flatten that curve hopefully nicely soon and we'll go through this it's but you know it was interesting i was in a store just just before i came uh, to the studio and i had to get something and and i walked down the aisle and there was a group of two or three people standing in front of me and i thought okay they they moved off the side i said no i went around in another aisle and and went you know just took a long way around and i thought Afterwards, I didn't do that before. That's the kind of thinking that we, we, we really do need to get ourselves into to make this work. That's a really good example. You went in a curve. It's a different from the curve we want to flatten, but it's, it's it a leads different, to it. Exactly, yes. yes. It leads to it. Yeah. We, we just do things a bit differently. And uh, it's, uh, it kind of takes a little bit of time to get your head around. I want to ask you a question. Um, which has actually asked of me, but also is, I think, really pertinent to um, some people's on the margin. Um, earlier the, the, on today, we, we, I was on um, Great County Life, we were talking about Salvation Army and their responses to, um, to the situation, which is actually quite interesting. But I was also asked by other groups, what about people who are in home who are in, uh, who are managing a disease like dementia, and you've got a single caregiver and a person with dementia, and they depend on a lot of external supports. What are they to do? What can they do? What opportunities would they have? Because all of a sudden, because the the supports for those kinds of of uh, people are um, cut off, day away programs are gone shut down properly, um, pe visits aren't being made. W w any ideas what people can do for that? Well, from the health unit point of view, we have connected with our uh, stakeholders, local partners, mm -hmm. uh, NGOs, different the counties, and we are uh, trying to you know, facilitate that discussion. What can we do for the homeless population? What can yes. we do for shelters? Yes. What can we do to people who depend on the food box? Historically, the food box program is a really successful program mm -hmm. run by volunteers. Uh, you know, how are we going to ensure that volunteers are going to continue? Is there more volunteers? Are there more volunteers who can support this program during this uh, time? And and again, David, like I, if I had all the answers, I probably should go to, to Stockholm pick up my Nobel Prize, <laughs> but I don't. 
yeah. I, yeah. I uh, as MOH and my team in the health unit, our role is to get the community together, the public, mm -hmm. send the right messages, uh, coordinate the efforts. And I am confident the effort of the collective efforts of, of mm -hmm. the different uh, stakeholders around the table would address these things. Yeah. Uh, you know, be, be a little more. I'm going to be a little more specific here. Let's say Mrs. Mrs. Jones and her husband. She, he has dementia. She's managing it with supports. In a time like this, can a, can a neighbor go in if there's no signs of COVID-19 and and give her a hand to let her give her a break? Maybe let her step outside and go for a walk. Uh, make sure that that person is okay as long as there's some distancing going on. And washing that, of hands. That, that would be very proper. Yeah. And that what we, you know, at the end of the day, organizations can do a lot, but the public can the public do the has most. To, so, so neighbors, neighbors can, can step in and, and will have to step in perhaps in these situations. Certainly. And everybody can, can uh, do something. Even, even as simple as hand washing and taking care of uh, protecting our self from infection yeah. means we're protecting our neighbors from the transmission. Right, right. And, and there is no need for fear. Like you look at the, you start by asking me about viruses, yeah. the coronavirus. I'm going to go on a little detour, come back to this specific point, absolutely. I promise you. Absolutely. Viruses, uh, these little things, um, before the 40s, the medicine, uh, medicine and science consider them uh, a poison. Mm -hmm. They didn't know if they're alive. Then they consider them maybe uh, a life form. Then in, uh, I think in the 46, uh, uh, a gentleman with the name of Wendley S uh, Stanley, uh, a researcher, won a Nobel Prize to prove that they are not alive. To meet the defi definition of life, you need to consume energy and uh, produce energy, uh, metabolism, basically, to grow, to respond mm -hmm. to stimulus. Mm -hmm. Viruses don't do anything of this. They do the only thing that's close to life self-replicate, but they cannot do it on their own. They need that cell from our lungs or nose to actually, they hijack the cell and make their own copies and they destroy the cell by doing so and give us the disease, but they replicate. My whole point of this little detour is they don't have wings or legs to fly. We don't need to be afraid of it. It's not like, you know, the tick that uh, transmits Lyme disease. You know, if you go for a walk, they, it might crawl on you or the dog and yeah, get to yeah, you. Yeah. You can go into any room where a patient is sitting. If you do the right thing, use the uh, right PPE, pr uh, protective uh, uh, equipment, um, the, the gloves to keep that distance, mm -hmm. you can, with full you know, confidence, minimize your risk. So there is no need to be afraid and lock yourself up in a room. You can still go to your walks and go to your neighbor and help them. That's no a symptoms. really useful statement that we do not need to be afraid and we can still do some semblance of our normal lives. That's a really helpful statement it's because then that's, that's good to hear. Certainly. And, and just think of the, the health care providers in the hospital on a mm -hmm. daily basis. They know that there is risk. They signed up for that. Mm -hmm. But you do the right thing. You don't worry about these things. And again, uh, it's in the hand of all of us to help our neighbor. That's, yeah. uh, and, and that's what's good about our communities. Like I, I, I am realistic. I'm not going to say the world is utopia. Uh, people <laughs> are going to jump. And, uh, but there is goodness in, in our community, yes, goodness there is. in people. And, and you know, this is a time to show it. Yeah. I, I know that some of the organizations that, that help people on the margins, well, I know um, uh, the Salvation Army has m cut off all of their, they're actually they've moved to permanent staff only. So it's the permanent staff who are working and they're rotating their permanent staff. They're not, and their volunteers have been sent home. Um, I think some of the other organizations have done the same. Uh, unless you're paid staff and agree to be a part of it, you, you volunteers take a, take a um, sabbatical, if you will, for however long it takes. But at the same time, there are some organizations who are struggling and who need those those volunteers just to 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 keep on going so probably worth keeping an, uh, your ears open for those volunteer opportunities if you wish and wash your hands and do the right things around distancing and everything absolutely and there are a lot of things that people can be creative to do like now oh, yeah. we know that restaurants are closed but delivery is still on 
Mm -hmm. Anybody can pick up the phone and call the restaurant and say, please deliver three meals to that corner. There are homeless people there. Yeah. Right? It, it would zero risk for the person using their visa on the phone and, you know, provided three good meals to three people who need it. There you go. Interesting idea. Interesting idea. Um, and, and we can support local businesses as well. That's right. Here we go. We're, I think yeah. we, you know, like two brains can create something that might work for many people. Mm -hmm. And that's where in the health unit we bring the different partners around yeah, the table. Yeah. And the products are, are really impressive. I, yeah, knowing some of the staff as I do, it's, uh, you start to get into that very creative environment and it gets to be very, it, it just, it, it gives life to hear some of those the really cool ideas that start percolating up but that actually uh, are quite practical. Um, here in the city, uh, you, you can still walk in the parks. Oh, no reason why not. Outdoors, uh, the risk is, is negligible. Like yeah. Unless you're, you know, in getting in contact with people who could be sick. Right. The but risk is zero. Again, distancing becomes yeah. a, a possibility. And uh, if the weather's decent, hey, maybe this will have a positive spin-off in, our, in lo our level of fitness for some of us. That's a good point. And, and talking about the, the weather, there are certain opinions that uh, say when the weather is warmer, the transmission is going to be lower. Really? So if okay. we get to the spring, we might you know, get over the hump. However, the, the general uh, consensus that if the transmission slowed down in the summer, it might come back next year. That's a question you asked. Well, that's before. that's that's a question I, I was going to ask you. Uh, here is that that we're seeing the big okay the curve. We let we flatten the curve, but it goes out. What happens when we reach summer and when we reach fall? Are we going to see it again? So again, this is one of these questions that if I have the answer, I should go to Nobel. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're, or you'd be a very wealthy man, right. one or the other. But my own bias is I, I am not sure if the summer is going to slow transmission or not. You right. look at the map, Australia is in the summer right now. True. They have similar transmission to uh, countries that are in the winter. Um, if it's slowed or not, if we spread the curve over many, many months, uh, this thing can stay with us maybe a year, mm -hmm. maybe two. Um, it wouldn't be in the same intensity that we're in right now. I, I suspect two f weeks or months of intensity, then it's going to slow down when the number of cases go up where the transmission slows down. Um, but we could be watching the uh, birth of a new common cold. You know, oh. at some point in the history, there was no common cold. Then a coronavirus, common cold is a coronavirus as well, jumped from animals to humans probably. Then it became a, a yearly event or, you know, annual event. Uh, this could be the next common cold. Or it could be just, you know, everybody gets it and gets immunity to it and uh, just not there. Um, it could be anything. So again, I, I hate to support you. I don't have a specific answer for it. <laughs> but, That's okay. But uh, That's okay. you know, I suspect for the short term, weeks and possibly a few months, we're going to be dealing with this in mm -hmm. an intense way. Sure, sure. Um, what about the idea of a vaccine? I mean, this, um, I hate to say it's a false hope, but every uh, even now, the the the. the development of vaccines and so on is big news. Is that a realistic option in uh, the short term? You know, this is probably a proof that you and I did not prepare these questions because That's again, okay. I'm going to disappoint you. I think it's in, uh, inevitable we're going to find a vaccine. Okay. In, in the first months, there were uh, over 11 candidates, candidate vaccines. Uh, the development of vaccine takes around a year and a bit more, uh, you know, a year mm. probably the shortest time sure. is going to do it quick. To find the vaccine or the candidate, it's, it, it, it was a uh, track record, one month, and the sequencing of the virus was there, the candidates are there. Then you go into different stages to approve a vaccine. Mm. Uh, the first stage, uh, clinical trials have uh, um, different stages. The first one is for safety. You give this candidate vaccine to 2030, healthy volunteers and see, is it going to hurt them? Because the first uh, principle in medicine, do no harm. So if the candidate passed that stage, which would take about three months, you go into the second stage, uh, stage two trials, clinical trials, where you would give it to people who are sick enough. So it is actually ethical to give them this mm -hmm. and see if it's going to work. 
and then uh, clinic, uh, stage three clinical trials to, to see it in a bigger sample, maybe 200, 300, 400, to see the benefits and not. So this process would take uh, a, a year. And then there are four, uh, stage four, which is post-marketing, but that's you know, not for the immediate need. Right. The, the better hope, I think, the, for us is treatment, because treatment trials are shorter. When you give the, vac the vaccine to somebody, by definition, they're healthy. It's unethical to expose them to something that's not 100% studied. Right. But for treatment, somebody who's you know, in a critical situation, desperate, let's try these things. And usually it takes about five, six months. According, these numbers are from the CDC, the American Public Health System, which is a very like top-notch system in the world. I trust their estimates. I would say five, six months for a treatment, uh, one year for a vaccine. Uh, I suspect next year we're going to meet here and say, "Oh, that's a vaccine." And yeah. You know, uh, w will, would it be something that would be incorporated into the annual flu shot? Um, Possibly not specifically the flu shot, but in the, in the list of vaccines, recommended vaccines. Yeah. So it could be, be yeah. just like your DPT or, or your... A, a, again, it could be that's uh, the, the disease spread and all of us have immunity and right. next year, you know, whomever newborn is going to get it and it's minor because for kids it's not a big issue. No. So right. it might not be cost effective. Uh, to give it to everybody since everybody got the immunity. Again, that's a different scenario yeah. we're going to examine at that time. Sure. Well, that's, that's something certainly to keep in mind that, that um, while we may be in a, I hate to use the bad word, panic demo, but pandemic. Oh, I see. <laughs> you like that? Um, there's a little bit of panic in all of us, I think, that, that the, that the long, longer term outlook is okay, we, we've got this, or we've, we're, we're working on this. As a medical officer of health in Grey Bruce, I am concerned. However, the sky is not falling. Right. The sky is not falling, and, and uh, you can use different uh, scientific methods to mm -hmm. evaluate uh, the risk and the, the, uh, the perception of risk in the public's eye. Yes. Like I mentioned before, uh, San, Peter Sandman's framework for, for risk assessment, whether you're going to uh, manage outrage, people who are outraged about something that's not very important versus uh, pushing people who are not concerned to be concerned about something, or uh, manage a crisis, or be in the happy medium where people are concerned but they're not afraid. Yeah. From my own assessment and my team's assessment of the situation, uh, our communities, the public perception mm -hmm. we are at that happy medium people are concerned rightly so yeah and they're that's a really good thing to be used as a fuel for them to like for them to use it as a fuel to do the right yeah. thing what is the um, atmosphere in the health unit right now there's what a hundred people who work in the at the at the health unit we have a hundred hundred twenty depending yeah, on depending the, on, 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 on know, a variety of such circumstances part time or not yeah. uh, summer or winter uh, the team is uh, full blast responding to the public it, just because of the announcement and, and the situation evolving there. Uh, there were so many um, calls coming in uh, and, and I think there was a backlog for two days that we just ironed out from the weekend. Uh, we activated IMS, uh, Incidence Management System. Uh, it's an administrative role that uh, procedure that would allow us to pull staff from different departments to support mm -hmm. the ID team. Um, a again, to my delight, uh, people are burning the candle at both ends, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I find part of you know being uh, a medical officer of health slash CEO, there is a part of me that I want to take care of my staff, and I find myself going around uh, at least twice a day to tell people you know take a break, be mindful of your own health because mm -hmm. if you're not healthy, you're not going to be able to serve right. the public. And, and you know, that's a really good thing to see your staff engaged and putting the effort and that you need to slow them down, which speaks to, the, to their commitment. And, mm -hmm. and, and again, they, they are the experts in what they do. Um, people who connect the health unit, they would get good response no, no matter what. And, and again, uh, I would encourage the public to listen to the science, to listen to the politicians talking to them, to... W I, I should have mentioned this just because of the nature of this program. I really can attest firsthand 
to the engagement of our local politicians, right. whether they are at the municipal level or the provincial level, our representatives in, in the provincial level, and the provincial uh, politics. Mm -hmm. Like you said early on in, in our chat, there is transparency. The numbers are out there. People are not sugarcoating mm -hmm. it, and they're not sending the fear message that we see in some other uh, you know, jurisdictions mm -hmm. or countries. Uh, um, and and, and I, I heard it in two ways, this statement back in the day from a mentor of mine. He said, as a medical officer of health or a specialist in public health, similar if you're a politician, in one day if you do your work well, following health policy or health, uh, uh, health in all policy principle, in one day or in one week, you can save as many life and suffering as uh, a healthcare provider in their entire career. Yep. And I can I can give an example. Uh, We've, we're almost out of time, believe it or not. So I'm going to leave it right there, Doctor Era. Thank you so Sorry, much for having I, me. My, my my voice has just told me four minutes. I thought she said one minute. So okay, go so ahead. I'll give the example. Make it brief. Um, y you you might be getting out of your car in a parking lot and mm -hmm. see a lady carrying her son out of or daughter out of uh, a vehicle and the kid is giggling. Um, it's, a, it's a nice, natural, normal scene. To me, when I see it, I see that people who preceded me in the profession of public health and the politicians who listened to them and supported their call implemented uh, uh, seed belt policy. Good point. That kid, their, that mom could have hit the brake any time mm -hmm. if in her trip and that kid could have fallen broken their nose but because of that policy that was implemented years ago that kid is giggling there is a lot of things that people don't see that public health does we are like the modem in your house uh, you forget it exists until it's broken until True. there is a crisis like the one right now and at that time we can become rightly so the center of attention and center of service to the public and I am confident our system, our local politicians, our provincial politicians, uh, and federal um, are doing a great job to serve the public. I think that they're, they're listening. Um, the other thing I would add is that um, we've asked our politicians to come on politically speaking and they have responded very favorably. So hopefully in future shows they will be, um, we'll have the warden. I'm hoping to have our, uh, our MP and we've invited our MPP to be on the show to talk about uh, how they're dealing with it. So we'll hopefully get a, a broader perspective, not just a health perspective, but also a, a political perspective on what's going on. So we're certainly looking forward to that. The, I think the other, the other thing that, that you're, f you're also flagging for us is that public health is, has always been there, but not always as aware as we as we we would like to think it is um, I mean my own family were some of the public health leaders or about two generations back were some of the public health leaders um, in uh, in nursing and you know when I hear their stories I'm thinking wow that's pretty remarkable stuff they did and then again we're in that same position today people are building on the shoulders of, of those who have gone before and uh, you continue to do so. Uh, we do have just a minute left, so I'm going to thank you for being a part of the show, uh, Dr. Era, and coming in and, and to talking to us about uh, the COVID-19 situation and our best wishes to you and to the team at uh, Grey Bruce, the Grey Bruce Health Unit. And uh, I'm sure we'll be watching and hearing from you over the next few weeks. I hope not months. Thank you. Thank you for having me, David. And thank you for being a part of Politically Speaking. My guest has been Dr. Ian Era, the Medical Officer of Health here in Grey Bruce. I'm David Sherman. Stay healthy. Rogers TV viewer response line, email us, or connect with us on social media.
Hey, Attack fans, it's Ethan Burroughs, number 29 for the Owen Sound Attack. Catch every Owen Sound Attack game live on Rogers TV. Clarkson Wedding Essentials has contracts that need to be honored. You can't mess around with the most important day of people's lives.